Thanks for coming on the show, Anne. I think it's been a lot of fun. Thanks for having me, Pernay. Yeah. I'm really excited Excuse me, guys. to, to yeah. talk. I just got to adjust yeah. this. Yeah, what's what's going on, Michael? What do you need? Well, you know, the distance is really important because every time you double the distance, uh-huh. you have the amount of decibels that reach the mic. Okay, and what does that mean? I think you should just Google it. Oh, okay. Um, I hate to interrupt, guys, but maybe we should get to the episode because it's about just this, understanding complicated topics. Oh. Okay. Let's, let's do it. All right. Welcome to Build, brought to you by Pivotal Tracker. I'm your host, Pornima VJ Shanker. In each episode, innovators and I debunk a number of myths and misconceptions related to building products, companies, and your career in tech. Now, one huge misconception that we all face is that when we're trying to explain a technical concept, if someone doesn't immediately get it, we think, you know what, it's their fault. They're too much of a lay person and we advise them to just look it up. Turns out the person who's explaining the technical concept, it's actually their fault for not explaining it. And I know that might seem counterintuitive, but in today's episode, we're gonna explain why the onus falls on the explainer. And in a future episode, we'll give you some techniques on how you can get better at explaining technical concepts to a mixed audience or to a lay person. And to help us out, I've invited Ann Janzer, who is the author of a number of books ranging from writing to marketing, and she's kind of a cognitive science geek. Thanks for joining us today, Ann. Thanks for having me, Purnima. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. So you've got a new book coming out, and it's all about explaining technical concepts and being understood. Maybe you can dive into the origin story for what inspired you to write this book. Sure. So the, the, the title of the book is Understood. So it's about writing to be understood. And it came from two uh, things in my life. One is that I spent a lot of my time in the technical industry uh, as a freelance marketing writer working for dozens and dozens of different companies, trying to explain these really geeky technologies to a business audience. Um, so that's familiar to most of your, your viewers. Yeah. Um, but second, I also, as you said, I'm a bit of a cognitive science geek, so I love to read all these books about the brain and psychology and behavior and behavioral economics. And you notice that some authors are really good at explaining this stuff. And you think, well, so there's parallels between what they do and what I was doing, which is explaining complicated abstract topics. So are some people just like born better at this? I don't think so. I took a close look at what these writers do, and I now I called up and talked to some of them about the, what they do, which is great. And it turns out that there are just methods and techniques and approaches that we can all use to become better at being understood when we're talking about something to people who don't share our knowledge about it. So it's great that there are all these experts who understand why this is important, but for our audience out there, maybe they're not sure why this is important. We can dive into that in a little more detail. Yes. Yeah, so you may not feel like, you may feel, well, I'm the expert, you know, it, it's not on me to make sure that everybody understands. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not my problem, basically, sure. if I'm explaining it, but it is your problem. It really is. Yeah. Um, and the cognitive science shows that. When you explain something that's complicated and you use words or uh, terms or even writing techniques that they don't understand, um, you are giving the audience extra cognitive load. You, they're, you're making them do extra work, not to understand the thing that you're saying, but even to get through to the thing that you're trying to explain to them. Um, and there's research shows that when people experience cognitive load, certainly while reading, mm-hmm. they don't assume that the writer is smarter they actually assume that the writer is less smart. So when they don't get it, they don't think, gee, I must be stupid. They think, eh, they're not so smart. Um, There's a study by a guy named Daniel Oppenheimer, who's now at Carnegie Mellon, but he did this back when he was at Princeton. Mm -hmm. And I have to read the name of the study because it totally illustrates what it's about. Consequences of erudite vernacular utilized irrespective of necessity or problems of using long words unnecessarily, (laughs) which is great. Yeah. Um, And in the study, they had people look at the same passage written two ways, one in a more straightforward way, one more complex using longer words or more wonky sentence construction, let's say. And people who read the more complicated ones rated the author as being less intelligent. So even in one case, even when they knew that the passage was by Rene Descartes, Hmm. right? They were reading translations and they're like, this is Rene Descartes from his meditations. They're like... 
yeah, you know, he's not that smart if they read the more complicated ones. So if you want to show up as being an expert, you have to be understood. And it's on you. It's on you to do that. Yeah. So why do you think people get into this habit of being long-winded or maybe using big words? Yeah, you know, and I don't mean to be critical of it because we all do it. Right. It's, it's a natural um, thing. If, if you work in a tech sector for a long time, you're surrounded by people who are all using these abstractions and these terms. You master the complexity of the subject. Um, you're part of a social group of people who have mastered that complexity. So it's natural to want to speak in a way that the people around you understand, to use those words. Um, but you need to remember that these abstractions that now come easily to you, like, you know, now you can ride a bike, but a toddler who can't ride a bike looks up at the person riding a bike thinking, yeah, that looks really hard. Yeah. So that's the situation that you're really comfortable with these abstract terms. But if you're talking to people outside of your domain, outside of your area, those terms are much more difficult to operate with. So it's natural to evolve. You get into this in crowd or you're surrounded by people who know and you kind of expect other people to know. Uh, and then when they don't, you're kind of like, well, just, just Google it, right? Uh, so how can we kind of get over this, uh, this expectation that our audience just knows? Well, we have to remember that, that we suffer from the curse of knowledge, which mm -hmm. is it's hard for us to remember not knowing the things that we not now know. Mm -hmm. So some of the times it's not that we're you know being dismissive of our audience. We're just assuming that they know the things, that these things are familiar to us, are familiar to them. Um, so you really have to get outside of your own head for a moment and try to put yourself in the perspective of your audience. That's why the title of my book is Understood. It's not like explaining. It's, it's understood because it doesn't matter what the words are coming out of your mouth or your pen. It matters how it sinks into the audience's mind. I don't know about you, but I've definitely had a few college professors. Their names will go unnamed. Uh, and in their 101 class kind of expected me to know certain things uh, or to, again, spend the time looking it up. So how can we combat that as well? Yeah, so that, that story drives me crazy yeah. because um, the, the purpose of a one-on-one -on -one class and the job of the professor of that class is to give people enough information, but also to incite their curiosity mm -hmm. so that they can learn enough to figure out if they want to pursue that field, right? And if they want to learn more or what is useful to them from that class. And in many ways, we all are in that same position as that one-on-one -on -one teacher, right? When we're talking to people who aren't familiar with our area, our job too is not to tell them everything I know or expect them to step up to what we want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Our job is to incite their curiosity about our topic so that they'll pay attention and get something and to give them a little bit more and to lead them into it. Um, that's a whole different way to think about explaining complicated stuff. It's not like I'm going to dump all this stuff on you you need right. to know. It's I'm going to pull you into this topic and bit by bit get you interested in it, tell you how it applies to you, and we'll see what goes from there. So it's good to know that we may suffer from the curse of knowledge and that not everyone is going to have the same level of expertise as us. What are some other things that may get in the way of people understanding when we communicate technical concepts to them? There's a couple things to be aware of. And one is that sometimes people think they understand already. And mm -hmm. you have to work around their existing models of what's happening. Um, you know, people think they understand what's happening, for example, to their data. When they go onto a website and use it and then go away, they, the data stays where they left it, right? And that's not always the case. Yeah. And so sometimes, um, you know, they, they think they have an understanding of something. Uh, you know, we always talk, and if you think about um, you know, how do you understand using storage. How is stuff stored on your computer? Mm -hmm. You think, well, I've got a disk and, you know, I may, maybe you think you have a directory, right? And then I have a folder and I put files in it. And that's nothing like what's really happening underneath, right? right? A file may be distributed over many areas of the disk. Some stuff is not on disk. It's in memory. It's in it's, the cloud. It's in the cloud. You know, it's, you, you can't come up to people and say, no, you don't know what's going on. You're wrong, right? Sure. You know, so you need to understand what their understanding is. Mm -hmm and figure out how to work around that. And then there are the topics that people, they want to cling to their understanding of it. You know, they don't want to hear about, um, it is something that disrupts their understanding of it. Mm -hmm. That's 
why, you know, if you search for a website on a website, if you search for a swimsuit on a website, and then you go to the New York Times, and it's serving you an ad for that swimsuit that you just searched for, you know, it can be really distressing, these yeah. retargeting ads, because they show us something that we don't want to hear about, which is that we're leaving this huge digital wake of data mm-hmm. around that people can use. And we find that distressing because we don't want to hear it, mm-hmm. but it's there. Yeah. yeah. So there's the concept of challenging people's current understanding, yes. and then there's the concept of ignorance is bliss. Yes. Right. Right. Okay. So those are both things that we need to be aware of. How can we know, because uh, I know in the next episode we're going to dive into how to get around this, but how can we at least develop an awareness to know which camp our audience may be in? That's, you know, the key thing is to think about your audience. And I, I think you need to answer um, three questions mm-hmm. about your audience before you go to speak to them mm-hmm. or before you write for them. It's um, what do they already know about this subject? And this requires that you put yourself in their perspective. And you may have to talk to people yeah. that, are, that are like your audience, right? Um, how do they feel about your subject? You know, do they have resistance to hearing the message? Uh, is this something that they like talking about? Are they curious or are they... You know, are they showing up for your talk under dress because mm-hmm. they have to? I mean, that's something you want to know too, right? Yeah. My boss is making me come to My this. My boss is yeah. making me come to this. And the third thing is what makes them curious? What can you use to hook their interest in the topic? Um, what's going to make them want to explore more about it? Yeah. Now, one final thing I've noticed, especially with a lot of my students and uh, audience members, is they can be on the flip side where it's not the case that they think they're the expert, but they feel like they really need to go down this path and be very, very long winded about an explanation instead of favoring brevity. So how would you recommend they kind of balance that? Right. So there's, there's two things I want to get at. One is that you need to make a careful distinction between what you want to talk about and what the audience needs to hear. Mm -hmm. And that may not there may always be, there may be a small overlap mm-hmm. um, and maybe you can widen that by making them more curious, but you need to, to respect what their needs are. Um, and that's the hardest thing for us as writers to do. I mean, I was just, when I worked on this draft, I wrote this whole section and then I thought this doesn't serve the book. I had to delete 10,000 words and just put it aside because it wasn't what the audience mm-hmm. needed. It wasn't what the readers needed. So that's one thing. And then second, I would look at the reason why they feel they need to, um, explain everything. And often I think it's an attempt to assert some kind of credibility. Mm-hmm. And credibility is such an important issue, right? Yeah. Um, it's, it's such a critical issue for speakers, for writers. But the way that we often go about asserting credibility can work against us. You know, if you if you say, well, I'm going to get up and at first I'm going to list off all my accomplishments right. so that I, they know I'm, I'm, I'm serious. Um, or I'm going to just take them through every little experiment or every little process I did to get to this so mm-hmm. they see that I worked really hard. Um, these things work against you because you know, the root of the word or credibility is believability, mm-hmm. right? That's what, what it means. Well, to be believed, you have to first be understood. So to be credible, you need to be understandable. And that means you're going to have to cut out that stuff. People will respect you more uh, think more of you if they can really understand what you're saying. So if you are meeting their needs mm-hmm. rather than asserting your own. Um, so if you come at it from that way, it gives you uh, an understanding for how to be more brief, what to cut and why to cut it. Well, thank you so much, Anne, for sharing why our explanations may be convoluted and, of course, why we need to do a better job at explaining them. I can't wait till our next episode where we're going to dive into a number of techniques and tactics to help our audience out there when it comes to explaining these. Now, Anne and I want to know, when was the last time you had to explain something that was complicated, maybe some technical jargon? Were you misunderstood? And if you were, how did you get over that misunderstanding? What were your techniques? Let us know in the comments below this video. And that's it for this episode of Build. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel to receive the next episode where Anne and I are gonna dive into some techniques to help you be more understood when you're explaining those technical concepts to your audience and to your teammates. Ciao for now. This episode of Build is brought to you by our main sponsor, Pivotal Tracker. We'd also like to thank our Platinum Patreon patrons, 
Corky Bites, The Developer Show, and Jamie Hand. Finally, thanks to the following new patrons. If you've enjoyed watching Build, please consider becoming a patron and contributing on Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash build. You can pledge $5 a month or more, and your pledges will go towards helping us produce and promote the show. In exchange, you'll receive perks like being mentioned in the credits, digital copies of our latest book, and Platinum patrons will receive exclusive perks like monthly online group coaching, where I provide more hands-on coaching on a number of topics related to entrepreneurship and leadership. To find out more and contribute, please visit www.patreon.com forward slash build.